When it comes to tools of the witch, plants and herbs are some of the most common. They're abundant, they're easily accessible, and you can get them pretty much anywhere, and a lot of times you can get them for free. Now right now in the Northern Hemisphere, we are knocking on the door of autumn. Fall is the best time to start going out and collecting things like flowers and leaves, seeds and berries, roots. There's a reason that we call fall the harvest season. Herbal witchcraft is some of my favorite because there are so many different uses for herbs, and if you have to be a little incognito with your witchcraft, everybody has spices in their house, so they're really easy tools to fly under the radar if you don't want everybody to know that you're casting. The image of a lone person wandering through the wilderness, collecting flowers and plants, is so wild and witchy that it's ingrained in the societal consciousness of what it means to be a witch. So in honor of fall around the corner, today we're going to talk safe, smart, and ethical tips for your next magical wild crafting excursion. Wait, did you say wild crafting? Wild crafting is just another fancy word for foraging, specifically when you go out into the wild to collect plants that aren't necessarily growing in your garden beds in your own backyard. Traditionally, wild crafting is when we go out into nature to collect plants for food or medicine, but we can also go out and wild craft plants for magical purposes too. As a note, wild crafting can also be considered collecting seeds for saving, for planting next season, or to create your own seed catalog at home. Seeds are useful and magical on their own, but there's also this other ecological nerdy world of seed saving that's really interesting, but a completely different topic. Call it wild crafting, foraging, or harvesting. Now is the time when we go outside and collect those plants. Why wild craft instead of harvest? Sometimes we don't have the ability to grow our own plants. Whether you don't have space for a garden or you don't have the right sun or soil conditions, it's not always possible to grow the plants and herbs that you need for your magical working. Wild crafting and foraging give us the ability to collect those plants that we wouldn't be able to grow on our own so that we still have fresh plant matter to work with. There's also the added benefit of developing a deeper connection to that plant where we learn to identify, find, and prepare them ourselves. Wild crafting in your local area helps you learn more about plant sustainability and responsibility to your local ecosystem and to the plants that you're taking care of. And from a more witchy perspective, local plants often have a deeper connection to our own magic. The plants from our local area, as opposed to mail order or plants from other stores, have more of the same vibration and energy that we live and work with daily. Especially if the land you're on is ancient or ancestral in some way. Maybe you grew up here. Maybe your family has grown up here. Outcrafting allows us to develop connection to the plants, but also connection to the land, which is something that is sorely missing in a lot of modern day witchcraft practice. What exactly do you do with herbal magic? Plants have a plethora of uses for magical purpose. Some ways we can prepare them are, dry them for tea for use in meditation, spell work, or therapeutic benefit. Plants with therapeutic benefit can also be tinctured for easy medicine. You can make flower essences for use in energetic and emotional healing. You can infuse plants and herbs in oils to anoint candles, tools, and yourself. You can dry, cut, and sift your wildcrafted plants for use as incense. You can also dry bundles to leave on your altar or as decoration around your home. And those are just some examples. There are a ton of more uses for plants in magic and witchcraft. I feel like these are becoming a regular video occurrence. I am a trained herbalist and a witch. What I'm not is a botanist or a medical doctor, nor am I with you when you're out in nature harvesting your plants. <clears throat> for legal reasons, I have to tell you that everything in this video is for entertainment purposes only, and I cannot be held responsible if you poison yourself by mistaking pokeberry for elderberry or something. Please do your own research before messing with the plants. Never take anything internally without extensively verifying what it is and what it'll do to you, and consult local experts with any specific questions. Be smart, friends. Now let's talk about plants. Tips for safe wild crafting. Have a variety of resources with you. This is where most people would start to tell you, don't rely on plant identification apps, and while you shouldn't rely on plant identification apps, I need you to know that you should be using plant identification apps. There are a ton of apps out there, some are better than others, but they're growing, they're becoming more abundant, and they're becoming more accurate. 
I highly encourage downloading an app or two because they can be really useful when you're out and about, even if you don't plan to take those plants home. And using them will help build their global databases. I'll put a couple up on the screen here. Now that being said, plant identification apps should never be your only resource to identify plants. Their database may not be extensive, or the app could get it wrong. There are a lot of lookalikes out there and you want to make sure you know exactly what it is you're looking at. I like to start with the plant identification apps because it gives me something to go off of and then I move on to my paper identification guides to help verify what it is I'm finding. Local field guides are a treasure trove of information and you should have at least one for your local area. I have three. When you have any doubt whatsoever, leave the plant there. Make sure to take lots of notes and pictures about what it looks like, how it's growing, where you found it, so that you can go home and do more research before you come back. Because one of my last favorite resources are Facebook identification groups. You throw up a bunch of pictures, you put the location, and there's someone that will know what that plant is. I've never seen them be stumped. It's amazing. And that all leads me to my next point. If you aren't sure 100%, do not harvest that plant. Because at the very least, it could be a waste of your time and resources to take home a plant that you think is gonna do one thing for you when it's not actually gonna do that thing, whether it's magical or medicinal. But the more important thing to keep in mind is that there are a lot of deadly lookalikes out there and you don't wanna mistakenly take home some really bad neurotoxin because it looks like common yarrow. Make sure to dress appropriately too. Harvesting plants from the wild puts you in the wild. Bugs and animals may call that patch of plant home. Ticks are abundant in tall grasses. Mosquitoes are the minions of the devil. The sun, she is a fickle mistress. Think about where you're going to be and make sure you prepare appropriately to keep yourself protected from the environment. Bring a first aid kit or maybe even a friend. You never know what could happen when you're out alone in the woods. That's it, that's the tip, be smart. Check the status of the land. And I don't mean who owns it or what native land it might be, although you should do those things too, more in ethical wildcrafting, but make sure that the area you're wildcrafting from isn't sprayed with pesticides or chemicals, especially if you're planning to take that plant internally. Public land is often sprayed with pesticides and weed killers, even places that you wouldn't think would normally be sprayed, like wild forest areas. Just make sure that the plants you're taking from any given area are safe to be taken from any given area. Tips for ethical wildcrafting. Before you do anything else, you need to know what plants are at risk in your area. Now there are plenty of website resources where you can quickly check and see what plants are at risk in your area. I'll put some resources up on the screen. But I don't care how much you need that plant, you do not harvest it if it is at risk at anywhere on the spectrum. You can be putting the future of that plant's survival in danger. You can be damaging local ecosystems and who knows what else. If you really care about one of those at-risk plants, you want to work with it, join some kind of program like Seed Savers where you can help bring plants back and get them off of those at-risk lists. And honestly, that will do more for your energetic connection to the plant than harvesting it from the wild ever would. Remember the 10% rule. Take no more than 10% of a specific plant and take no more than 10% of plants from a certain area. This is to ensure that the plant can continue to propagate it's also to help pollinators if those are pollinating plants. And again, remember, we're trying not to cause too much of a stir in our local ecosystems. And a related tip, keep local wildlife and pollinators in mind when you're harvesting. I don't care how much you think you need that plant, the bees probably need it more. And if you don't find a large patch, just leave the whole thing. Those animals and pollinators have first rights to that plant. You can always order some already cut and dried or even try to grow your own. Again, check the status of the land before you go. Make sure you're not harvesting from private property and that you have permission to be there if it is private property. You don't want your wildcrafting session to be cut short because the cops show up. Local farms are honestly kind of great for this. If you reach out to them ahead of time and tell them that you want to collect some of their crazy weeds that grow on the edges of their fields, they might love you forever. Don't assume that someone who owns private property is always going to say no. It doesn't hurt to ask. Basically, all ethical wildcrafting boils down to is be respectful of the plants, be respectful of the land, and be respectful of other people. Tips for smart wildcrafting. These smart wildcrafting tips are ones that I've developed over the years because I've made all of these mistakes, 
So I wanna save you the pain that I've had to deal with. Know what you want before you go out. If you want to go on a random walk through the woods to see what grows in your area, that's awesome. Do that. That's how you start to get familiar with your local land. But there is nothing more frustrating than going out hoping for a specific harvest and coming back with the wrong plants. Or worse, coming back empty-handed. Narrow down the plants that you're hoping to find. Do some research into their growing conditions and pinpoint areas that you think they may grow. Check the status of the land, make sure you have all the tools you need. Go out with a plan. If you are going out just to see what you can find, that's okay too. Make sure to bring a camera or sketching tools so that you can take notes and documentation of the plants that you find along the way. That way you can go home with your observations and do some more research on the plants that grow in your area. See what they're useful for, if you can use them, how to harvest them, how to prepare them, and then go back out later on so much more ready. Think about how you're going to prepare your plants ahead of time. When I say prepare the plants, I mean, what are you going to do with them once you have them? Are you going to dry them? Are you going to tincture them? Are you going to powder them? Are you going to infuse them? Some plants absolutely do better as certain preparations than others, so make sure you're doing your research. But know what your plan is for all of this plant material before you even go out to harvest it, let alone before you get home go out to Wildcraft, make sure you're packing your supplies accordingly. If you plan to tincture or infuse these plants, bring small mason jars to put them directly into. If you're going to hang them to dry out, bring elastics and twine to bundle them up for easier transport while you're out there. If you're going to press them, bring a heavy book. Press them on site. My favorite method of collecting and transporting plants, regardless of use, but especially if I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them yet, is to collect them in flower sack towels, tie them up into cute little bundled packages, and then get back to a flat surface where I can process them with press and seal food wrap. What I do is essentially create a single layer of the plant in the press and seal food wrap, and then put another layer of the wrap on top, press out as much air as possible, and fold it up into neat little packages. So they create flat, easily transportable packages that are mostly airtight that will last to keep them safe until I get home. The other really cool thing about this method is that I can write directly on these packages and I don't have to worry about like washing the marker off of a mason jar later on because I always forget what the plant is or where I got it or the date that I got it if I don't write all of that detail down right away. Now this method isn't perfect because it does require using press and seal food wrap which is not a reusable resource and I do try to stick to glass, paper, and wood reusable tools when I'm working with herbs, but nobody's perfect. Take extensive notes on the plants that you find. When you're out wild crafting plants and bringing them home, there's some information that you want to make sure you collect and keep with that plant. Know the name of the plant, both its common and Latin name. Know how much of the plant was growing in the area where you took it from. Where that area was. What time of year you went, so the date. What time of day you went and any other factors that you needed to have or be aware of to collect that plant. Next time you go out to harvest this plant, you'll have timeline details to be able to recreate your trip and make the most out of your harvest. This also factors into the ethical tip of not over harvesting from an area because you know exactly where you've been. And if you work with other wild crafters and harvesters in your area, you can share that knowledge so you're all collectively not over harvesting a plant from an area. If there's one tip you take away from this video, it's this. Remember to enjoy yourself. Whether you're on a mission to collect certain plants for medicine or magic, or you just wanna to get to better know your local ecosystem, you're doing this because you enjoy it, because it's fun and interesting for you. And make sure you maintain those feelings. Spending time in nature, regardless of your purpose, especially at this time of year, is always magical. For my discussion question of the week, don't you just love my coffee mug? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What are some of your favorite ways to incorporate plants and herbs into your magic? Let's talk about it in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up to feed that algorithm and consider clicking subscribe so you get more content like this. Also click that bell to be notified when I post a new video every week so you'll never miss an update. If you want to get content like this before anybody else and access to exclusive content and learning opportunities, make sure to check out my Patreon link below tiers that start at just one dollar and for the month of september i'm running a new patron special make sure to check all the details in the description 
You can also find me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and skulking around your local witchcraft store, so make sure to say hi if you spot me in the wild. Thanks so much for watching, friends, and happy harvesting! <laughs>